Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man's Dame here with me, and we got a lot to talk about today. Two games, but nice. a lot of off the court news. Draft lottery just passed, so coach is getting fired too. So uh, a big docket here. As always, got to get the housekeeping out the way first. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to the socials. We got the Instagram. We got the TikTok. If you're listening on Apple Music or Spotify, be sure to leave five stars and drop a review. That helps the, t- the channel and the podcast out a ton, so we appreciate that. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. How are we doing today, Dane? I'm all right, man. I'm doing better than some might think, you know, being that my Lakers lost last night. But I, I got some... I'm optimistic. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not as I'm not as bad as I would have been if that halftime score stayed the same the whole game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. I'm all right, man. I'm all right. Definitely. We can go ahead and hop right into it. First game in the Western Conference Finals tipped off last night right after the draft lottery. Uh, like you said, Nuggets were looking like they were running away with it at halftime. It was, what, 20, 21 points at halftime, 18, something mm-hmm. like that, somewhere around 20. Um, and – Jokic looked unstoppable. He had six offensive rebounds in the first quarter. He had, he had 12 like, boards total in the first <laughs> quarter, bro. It was – oh, my God. It was bad. I thought he was in for a 30-30 game. Yeah, he had 8-12-5 and five at halftime. So, taking over in typical Jokic fashion, getting it done, points, rebounds, assists. Um, and the Lakers just came out slow against the Nuggets team that has not dropped a game at home all postseason. Um, mm-hmm. And they look dominant as ever to start this game. And then in the second half, the Lakers made a couple of adjustments at halftime. Um, were able to slow Jokic down a little bit, especially there in the fourth quarter, um, making that switch, putting Rui on him, letting AD kind of be that Roma, which a lot of people speculated, um, taking him off of off of Jokic, which they had, he had he'd been the primary defender on him for basically the first you know two and a half, three quarters of the game. Um, mm-hmm. But they definitely, I think, found something there in that switch that I'm sure they'll go to to start game two because it, it provided a lot of results from a lot of good results for them. Um, I have a stat here from last night um, when AD was the the primary defender on Jokic. He put it was 15 plays. Um, Jokic was scoring one and a half points per play, 10 of 13 from the field with two turnovers. But when Rui was the primary defender and AD was the you know kind of that roaming help defender. It was six plays, but he was scoring 0.6 points per play, 0 of 2 from the field with two turnovers as well. Um, so definitely a lot more havoc being caused by AD um, playing off the ball and playing Jokic in that way. But overall, what are, your, what are your big takeaways from this game? I think there's there's good and bad for both teams going into next game. Um, so yeah. a, lot to, a lot to unpack here. Yeah, honestly, you know, like you said, Jokic started – huge in that first quarter um I just felt like we came out slow like we had no like fight we had no energy we we had no hustle to us like it just seemed like we were tired like you know a lot of people pretty much well, actually pretty much everybody were talking about you know the Denver altitude how it's different playing there how you get tired quicker and it's like in the first quarter it just felt like it just hit us you know what I mean like we just came out slow we weren't hustling but and a lot of it it wasn't really on not a lot of it wasn't really on Anthony Davis as far as those rebounds. Like, yes, I feel like he could have did a better job rebounding the ball, but a lot of it was just people just standing around around the basket. You just see Jokic just coming in. You seen uh, Aaron Gordon coming in, getting those offensive rebounds. So I just feel like we we didn't have really any hustle to us. And part of that also could have been because we started Dennis Schroeder instead of Vando, so we had a small lineup out there. So normally we're bigger than most teams. This this time starting the game, we were pretty much smaller than the Nuggets. So mm. we were just getting bullied in the first quarter. That's really what it was. So yep. um, next thing we need to come out definitely way better than that. We can't have Jokic getting 12 off, twelve rebounds in the first quarter. Like, that, he, that's insane. So um, that that stuck out to me. Um, like you said, I liked how we we switched it up. We put Rui on Jokic, seemed to slow him down, slow him down at least a little bit. So now, like you said, Anthony Davis could be that little – that roaming defender, being able to defend the basket um, and sag off of Aaron Gordon. So I I would be very surprised if Rui doesn't start the next game, or at least if he doesn't start, he probably will be coming in way earlier than he normally would because obviously yeah. he had some success when we try to make that comeback. So um, I mean, I'm curious to see how the next game goes. Like I said, we just need to – we need to hustle. We need to get those rebounds. And honestly, if I'm being honest, I don't think the Nuggets are going to shoot that – insane again they were hitting some ridiculous shots bro. yeah 
No, bro, the one to end the quarter, the, at the end of third quarter, when Jokic hit that over Anthony Davis, <laughs> bro, like, he just, like, he looked like Dirk. Like, yeah. bro, it was, it was ridiculous. I don't think I've ever seen Jokic miss a jump shot in my life, bro. Like, this guy, yo, this guy is ridiculous. Like, yeah. He is insane. And the crazy thing is, I don't even think Anthony Davis played bad defensively. I really this was probably was also AD's good. best offensive game of the postseason. Yes, he had 40. <laughs> think, think about this way. Anthony Davis had 40 points, and he was the second best big on the floor. Yeah. That is crazy. Like, that is insane. So, yeah, like I said, I don't think Anthony Davis played a bad game defensively. I just think Jokic is just that good. Like, right, this guy yeah. – He's just he's just that unstoppable. So yeah. Um, I do feel like too we have to find a way to. We need to either make him a scorer or a passer. Like he he had I believe it was like thirty something points, a thirty point triple double something like that, and was also getting his teammates involved, also getting KP KCP open looks, getting MPJ open looks. So it's like we can't have him killing us offensively, and then also making the right passes every single play and getting all these others involved. So I feel like we need to either do a job of stopping Jokic from scoring or stopping Jokic from passing in the first half or yeah. basically through the first three quarters he was doing both like they were just killing us so I'm curious to see how we come out next game like I said I feel like Rui's gonna start next game he's gonna start on Jokic and that should help out at least slow, at least slow him down a little bit offensively yeah he had everything last night finished with 34 21 and 14 you know it's a crazy game and really a crazy stat line when they pull it up after the game they're talking about 30 30 point 20 rebound triple doubles in the playoffs and Jokic now has the most in NBA history beating out Wilt. If you beat Wilt in a stat, you just did something. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> I was about to say anything beating Wilt, you did that. You did something. So, uh, so yeah, that's his, his second 30, second 30 point 20 rebound triple double game um, in playoff history, which is now the most in playoff history. I think that's now his, he's now third or fourth in, playoff triple doubles all time um, behind Russ, LeBron, and, and it might be somebody else there as well. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, like you said, Anthony Davis, he played a phenomenal game on both sides of the ball, but you know, like that just speaks to how good of a player Jokic is. Like right. as good as, as AD played defense, especially <clears throat> down in, you know, in the second half, like Jokic just always seems to make the right read, whether that's scoring or facilitating. Um, 40 points from AD was not enough to dig the Lakers out of the, the hole that they started the game in. Um, again, at halftime, and speaking to just the slow start that the Lakers had, I know LeBron talked about it in his post-game presser. Like, he was like, you know, that was pretty much all she wrote after the first half. Like, we had fight, but, like, if you don't come out of the game starting that slow, like, this is a completely different game, right? Especially how they were able to, to find that, the adjustments that they were able to in the second half on both sides of the ball, right? Like not just putting AD off ball and having, you know, a bigger body and really guard, guard Jokic so that AD can kind of come over and help. But I don't understand what the Nuggets were doing with some of their switches, but Jamal Murray was ev- like, especially down the stretch there in the fourth quarter, it was, you know, without hesitation, whoever has Jamal Murray guarding him is coming to set a screen for LeBron and they're switching it every time when they probably don't even need to. Um, right. And they're just – Put like willingly giving up size on LeBron's matchup, and so much of their so much of the Lakers' points or offense was coming off of, like we said in some of the previous series, deep paint penetration from LeBron or those LeBron posts up where he's just able to bully his way through, you know, the smaller Jamal Murray. So um, that's something that the Nuggets are going to have to to know that the Lakers are going to try to get more of um, going into next game and have to. You, you've got to just be more more disciplined on, on staying with those matchups because that puts you in such a, a disadvantageous position um, to have Jamal guarding um, LeBron in those situations. But um, at the end of the first half, Bruce Brown had 14 points off the bench. The Lakers bench had 15 points combined. Um, so just the slow start really killed the Lakers in this game. Like I said, I think both teams found different things that work really well for them um, on both sides of the ball, which I think is really exciting because – Again, we get to see what these coaches are doing um, with that that chess match in between games of always making constant switches. Um, I, we'll definitely see more of Rui in this series than we saw in this game. I mm-hmm. think we'll probably also see more of Vando than we saw in this game. 
it's just and again it's not anything against Schroeder or D'Lo or AR but like like we said you need size when you know Michael Porter Jr. is what 6'8 Aaron Gordon 6'9 Jokic is a legit seven footer like they're presenting a lot of size which going small did not work out like we said right like to start the game, AR was getting bodied up by Aaron Gordon. I saw an early possession uh, in, like, the first quarter. Aaron Gordon saw R.C. Reeves was on him. He called for an ice. So he's clearing people out so he can take him to the rim. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought about it, and it's like either, you know, Austin Reeves or D'Lo is going to have to be on Michael Porter Jr. or Aaron Gordon in that situation. And neither one of those is good, right, because Michael Porter Jr. can raise up and shoot over either of them. Neither of them are tall, are tall enough. Uh, but probably worse than that is neither one of them could stop Aaron Gordon from getting to the rim. Right. Um, so that's either going to result in a lot of buckets or one of them is going to get in foul trouble. So um, definitely I think we're going to see more Rui and more, more Vando moving forward. Um, if, if Mo Bamba can get healthy, something that I've also thought about, he could provide um, a, just a different look for Darvin Ham and some spot minutes with another big who probably is a better rim protector than – anybody else on this roster that besides AD and LeBron really, um, but can also stretch the floor on the offensive side of the ball. So that could be something to, to look to. I know he has an ankle injury, but, you know, in, in playoff series, like everyone on your bench could be viable. We saw Lonnie Walker was completely out of the rotation and found his way back in off of some spot minutes. Like I would not be surprised if that's something that Darvaham tries at some point in the series, because just based on how this game you know, went last night and off of some of my earlier predictions, this looks like it's going to be a tight seven game series. Either mm -hmm. way, I still think the Nuggets are the better team, but um, d these two teams have a lot left in terms of switches and matchups and adjustments that they can make. So this is going to be a long, hard fought series, but um, credit to the Nuggets. They knocked down some ridiculous shots last night. Michael Porter Jr. was knocking down crazy stuff. Jokic, Joel Murray was knocking down a bunch of tough shots. KCP, again, another 20-point game for them. He's it's been huge for them all, all postseason. So, um, yeah, they go ahead and take game one on their home floor, but it was not without a huge, huge second-half comeback from the Lakers to, to keep it close. Cut it down to three points multiple times there late in the fourth, but um, that LeBron three with about 50 seconds left when he had Jamal on him. That one just felt like, ah, uh, uh, he drove it. He had the drive. He's had the drive on Jamal Murray all game. Mm -hmm. And you don't need a three in that scenario. You know, you can you would take the two. There's plenty of time to just get a stop and still have a full 24 to work with after. So um, yeah. that was the one play from LeBron that I, I really didn't like there down the stretch that I think, um, you know, really ended up costing the Lakers this game in that moment. But, you know, there's so many other things that happened that, that kind of put them in that position, but excited for game two, man. This was a great game one. I feel like LeBron kind of wanted that, uh, like a, that Bleacher Report House of Highlights, moment yeah. right? There. Like, it, like, because think about it. If he hits that three, that's it, bro. That is a huge three. I would have tied the game. That'd have been that'd have been the biggest three of the game. But yeah, like you said, it's just you have Jamal Murray on you. You've been attacking the basket pretty much all game. I don't, I don't think he hit a three in this game at all. So it's like you don't really have it going. Like, if he made two or three threes before that, then I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, you know, you have it going from three-point line. But, like I said, you have Jamal Murray on you. They can't stop you in the paint. It's just like, I would I would have loved to see a drive there out of LeBron. But, you know, I, I have full faith we're going to come out in game two. We're going to make the, the proper adjustments. Like you said, we can't do the small lineup. Like, that worked against Golden State. This is not Golden State. Yeah. Like, they can actually punish us for going small. One of the, one of the reasons why I was a little bit nervous with the Golden State series is because – um. We, got, we were going to have either D'Lo or Reeves on, on Wiggins, and I thought he could have taken advantage of his height difference. He didn't really do much of that, but like I said, Michael Porter Jr., Aaron Gordon, they will 100% take advantage of that height difference. Michael mm -hmm. Porter, there were times Austin Reeves was playing great defense. He's just too small. He's, like he was yeah, shooting he right over shooting, his head, yeah. Like he, like he didn't even see him. He didn't even see the contest. Like I said, the play with Aaron Gordon literally drove to the basket and bullied his way into the paint. He looked like LeBron on that position, like yeah. bullied his way to the paint and got to the rim. So I, I will, I, I'm pretty sure we're going to get more of that big lineup, um, obviously because at the in the fourth quarter I had some – you've seen it worked a little bit. So looking forward to seeing that. And um, I, I, I'm i confident. I'm really confident. I really think we're going to come out, and I think we're going to win game two. It's, it's going to be a close one. Obviously, the Nuggets are a really good team. But I, I got full confidence that we come out, we win game two. Yeah, Nuggets still, again, like I said, have yet to drop a game at home. So it's going to be a tall task for the Lakers, but 
they want to win the series. They got to nab one in Denver, whether mm-hmm. that's, you know, game two, going to game five or game seven. They got to, got to find a way to try to get one there. Um, yeah, and I, I, I still feel like if we lose if we lose the next game, I still think we're fine. I still think we can hold home court. Like, I don't think the series is over if we go down 0-2, even though I don't think it will happen, but I, I definitely don't think the series is over if we go down 0-2. You've seen, even with the Suns, they tied the series up 2-2. Right. And at that point, it's just it's a best of three. So, like you said, exactly. we're definitely going to have to win one in Denver. Hopefully, it's just this next one, and then we could, you know, hold down home court. Yeah. You know, they always say a series doesn't start till a road team gets a win, so. Uh, both teams need to, to make sure that they're holding down home court for sure. Another thing I wanted to call out from this game, you know, it felt like the, especially in the first half, the pace of the game was like super fast. There was so much back and forth running up and down the floor. Um, I know Darvin Ham mentioned in his post game presser, he felt like um, there was too many times, and even the broadcasters too, right? He felt like there was way too many times where the Lakers were not sprinting back on defense either after a missed shot or even a made shot, felt like Jokic was just pushing the ball up the court so fast um, off of the inbound. And that was resulting in way too many easy buckets, buckets for the Nuggets who, again, were able to, able to, to get out to that early lead there in the first half. Um, and there were so many just bad Lakers turnovers early on, um, which I think, again, was just a result of how fast the game was, was going. They were just doing too much, trying to make some errant, th- trying to make errant passes, um, but I mean, looking at the box score, it, the Nuggets actually turned the ball over four more times than the Lakers. So um, they definitely tightened it down in the second half. And again, like we said, when they were able to slow the game down um, and, and get a lot of those switches that they wanted and play through LeBron, um, their offense looked a lot smoother. Again, AD going hyper efficient, 14 for 23, didn't miss a free throw, 40 point game. Like, even as a, in a losing effort, right? This is the type of AD we're going to need six or really seven games of this series, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is the type of performance that he's going to have to put up because it's just what it's going to be required when you're playing an opponent that's as talented and as deep as Denver. So, yeah, series is off to a, a great start so far. Yeah, 1,000%. Like I said, we just – Lakers are going to have to either take away – not take away. You can't take away Jokic, but either slow, try to slow down Jokic from scoring or, or slow down those others because, like I said, a 30-point triple-double along with, what was it, 21 points from KCP, 15 from Mike Porter Jr., 30 from Murray, 16 from Bruce Brown off the bench. Like, it's tough to win like that, especially along with the slow start. It's going to be tough to win. So, man, Jokic need to calm down, man. Why is this guy so good, bro? Like – Jokic is so good, and it pisses me off because it's like it's so beautiful to watch. Yeah. But when you're on the other other end of it, it's like, bro, why are you so efficient? Why are you? It's like every single play, whether it's him scoring or it's him passing, it is always like the perfect right decision, yep. and it's ridiculous to watch. Like, don't get me wrong, I like I've watched Nuggets games. I'm gonna be honest, when I watch other teams play, I don't watch it as like closely as I do with the Lakers, obviously, because that's my team. Like Lakers games, I watch it pretty much every single possession. I analyze every possession. So like actually seeing it with Jokic, it's like every single play, he makes the right play almost every single time. And it's yep. ridiculous to see. So I I genuinely think like Jokic is this whole postseason is probably the best stretch of basketball we've ever seen from him. Like as good mm-hmm. of a as a two time MVP is arguably had a very good case to be a three-time MVP this past year. Like, he continues to elevate his game. Or, like, he just continues to shoulder a bigger burden on all sides, like, on every aspect of their offense, right? Offensive mm-hmm. rebounding, like we said, scoring at all three levels, jump shooting, finishing on the inside, um, and then obviously, again, facilitating outlet passes, you know, dribble handoffs, screen and rolls, being the screener, being the ball handler in the pick and roll. Like, he has so many responsibilities for this Denver Nuggets offense. And like I said, to your point, it never feels like he makes wrong decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that's to his credit. I, I was thinking about it last night. Like, he is on the path and arguably is already kind of starting to cement himself as, like – one of the best centers ever easily in my opinion like he's Mm -hmm. entering that conversation like he's 
I was just trying to think in like since the turn of the century, right? Like there's Shaq and then him probably, right? Like obviously you're saying as far as, as far as best best centers ever, you're saying? Right, like since two thousand mm. on, right? Like oh, so, oh okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. It's like there's other guys like Embiid or like I just <laughs> He clears he's clearing a lot of people yeah. out of the way um, mm-hmm. just because he's like, I don't think we've ever seen an, uh, an offensive center like that before. I know they asked, I think it was Michael Wilbon before the game. He's been covering the NBA since like the seventies or eighties. And they were like, who does he remind you of? He was like, no one. Like I cannot. Right. It's, it's like, he's like, he has moves like Kareem, but they're not as smooth, but he's, big and you know punches the glass but he can stretch the floor and shoot like he just does so many different things and that hasn't even mentioned how great of a passer and playmaker he is and so it's like Mm. we've never seen anything like him before um and so he he really is a special talent and um i think and a great little segue to the, the the celtic sixers game seven right like he has shouldered the load for this Nuggets team. Um, he's carried them. He's been far and away their best player night in, night out, um, which is required of somebody who is a two-time MVP and looking to get to the finals for the first time. So he can take his name off that list of, of MVP players who's never made an NBA finals mm-hmm. um, because there is currently one MVP who has yet to make a conference finals. And that is this year's MVP in Joel Embiid, who will have to wait another season to make a conference finals because the 76ers got embarrassed in game seven in disgusting fashion, honestly. Um, It was bad. Oh, my God. I already gave my Joel Embiid rant last pod, and I could go on a whole nother one because – Doc already took the fall, and we'll we'll kind of dive into that a little bit later. But you know, he got fired very quickly, right? It was like two days after the game, not even one the next day, right? Monday. Yeah, it was. Um, it was yeah, it was quick. <laughs> they got him out of there quick. Fired after the game, in a game in a series where, and which is so crazy to say because. Uh, a lot of the criticism is rightfully so, right? Doc Rivers is typically criticized as a coach that does not make adjustments in playoff series, gets out coached pretty thoroughly in a lot of the, a lot of the times where his, his playoff teams lose and bow out early. I wouldn't say that was the case as much in this series. He tried a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. I don't know what coach you could have put Phil Jackson, John Wooden, Eric Spolstra. I don't know what coach wins this game where Joel Embiid and James Harden combined for 24 points in a game seven. They combined for eight shots. Eight shots. And you would think, oh, at least Harden got to the free throw line. He shot two free throws. It just wasn't aggressive. That was the problem. From the start of that game, it just looked like both of them were very, especially James, both of them were very, very passive and it's tough because you know for a fact to win this game seven in Boston, you, both you guys are going to have to have good games, good scoring games. Like, James, we yeah. didn't need point guard James this time. We really didn't. Like, we needed someone that was going to go out there. I'm not saying you got to score 40 again, but it would be nice for you to at least try. Like, it looks like even there were times where he drove to the basket and I felt like he could have shot the pull-up or he could have shot the floater or, or at least try to get all the way to the rim and he just – Passed out, kick out, passed kick out, out, passed out every single time. I'm like, I feel you should be looking for your shot right now. And as far as Joel and B, man, I I don't even know what to say because it's like, I understand he's he's good on the perimeter. I get it. You know, he's good with face ups. I I understand that. But it's like, there is no one on this court right now who's as big as you, as talented as you. Put your back to the basket and call for the ball, like call for a post up like it's like that that's the part that I don't know if that's really on doc not calling that for him but also it's like if I'm Joel and B like I'm the MVP I can I have the right to scratch whatever play we have called right and just and, go on the block and say give me the ball 
I'm going to give Doc the benefit of the doubt because it don't take a rocket scientist to say, let's get the MVP the ball right. in the post, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And, and try to win us this game. Um, because, again, it was down the stretch in game six. Didn't have a post up for the last six minutes of the game. Mm-hmm. This game was out of hand early. But, again, he's just not it, – It's you, you have to play better. You have to play better. This is not a – this game – it's not on Doc Rivers. This series, the vast majority of the blame, I would not put on Doc Rivers. There are other pieces to that puzzle, and more important than anything is, in this particular instance, is you have two star players. Look at James Harden's points totals in this series. Game one, 45, win. Game two, he had 12, loss. Game three, he had 16, loss. Game four, he had 42 points in an overtime win. Great. Game 5, 17. Game 6, 13. Game 7, 9. If you look back on this series, he's going to – he's like – he's probably averaging like upwards of 20-plus points. He mm-hmm. only scored over 20 twice. Right. Finished the series with a nine-point performance. Where does James Harden go in the playoffs, man? I Like, I, it doesn't make sense anymore. It's tough because it's really not a surprise, though. It's like that's been his knock his entire career, that he's just – he's this great offensive talent, one of the great scorers in NBA history. But when come playoff time in the biggest moments, it's like he just disappears. Yep. And it's like I don't know if it's because a lot of his game is getting to the free throw line. I don't know because obviously the refs hold their whistle a little bit more in the playoffs. I don't know if that's the case, but it's like – and the performances are just – like, they're not just like, all right, he has, he's having all right games. Like, he has bad games. Like nine Exactly. Like, nine points. Like, he has bad games. And this is – not even just now. Like, this is going back to his prime when he was with Houston. It's like – it's consistently him showing up small in, like, the biggest moments. And that's, that's the biggest knock on James Harden right now. Yeah, I like – I have saw people – and we, we've had discussions in the past, right, about, like, greatest – you know, you start putting him in that best shooting guard of all time list and, like, you're stacking mm-hmm. him up with guys like D. Wade. It's like from a talent perspective, at least in the regular season, right, like he's done more than D. Wade. He's, you know, been a number one option longer than D. Wade. Was putting up crazy numbers that, you know, D. Wade was never able to put up. He's never had the playoff success. And he's doing it again. It's like, I don't even feel like we should be able to compare the two of them right now. Because mm-hmm. we ain't never see D-Wade do this this consistently. <laughs> no, D-Wade has like, never done this. Listen, if you if you can't replicate – not no, not even replicate. If you can't up your game when you're an MVP caliber player come playoff time, you can't be in those discussions, especially compared to people who've, who've done that. You know what I mean? Multiple compared times. To people, championships exactly. multiple times. Exactly. Like you, you just can't be in that conversation. Like the regular season, I get it. What you do in the regular season should matter, should count. Like I've seen people now saying like, oh yeah, Dor- Jarrell and B, he didn't deserve MVP. Now all of a sudden it's like, Jokic should have been the MVP, which is like, you didn't have that take a couple weeks ago. Right. If that was, if ago. you thought he was the MVP then, fair, fine. But don't say that now because he had a bad postseason. It's not a postseason exactly. award. It's not a postseason award. I still feel like Joel obviously deserved his MVP because it's a regular season award. But with that being said, this whole discussion of Jokic and Embiid, it's like, as of now, you cannot have that discussion. Yo- you just seen what Jokic just did. Jokic had Embiid stat line for a whole game seven in the first quarter of this game mm-hmm. one. Like, you can't have those discussions right now. Like, Jokic clearly ups his game in the postseason. Like, you can't – you just can't compare the two right now. So, yeah. like, even look at look at a guy like Jimmy Butler, not to get too ahead of ourselves, but, like, like Jimmy Butler, people are, ca- like, saying he's one of the best players in the league. People are making his Hall of Fame case because of what he does in the postseason. Jimmy Butler is a – the, what, 20th, 25th best player come in the regular season as far as his play? He doesn't really care in the regular season. But come, po- come postseason – on most nights, he's the best player on the court, and that's what really matters because those are the biggest moments. Yeah, so, like guys like James Harden, Embiid. As of right now, it's just you can't put them in those conversations because their their play isn't up to par in the postseason. Yeah, and this is the third game seven right in what four years for the 76ers in the second round. 
Well, they lose um, the second one at home, right? The first one, obviously, being the Kawhi shot, not going to put mm-hmm. too much stock. That was literally took that shot alone to, to put right. them away. That was probably their closest chance of making a conference finals. And then I don't even know which one is more disappointing at this point. From a talent perspective, right, like when you lose to the Hawks with, with Ben Simmons, that one was bad. It's coming off an all defensive, all NBA year. <laughs> um, and just have an absolute collapse like that. But this one again, you're up three two. You have the reigning MVP. You had the chance in game six, literally handed to you. Can't close it out. And then you get absolutely embarrassed in, in game seven, especially the third quarter. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot to mention this. He scored 10 points in the third quarter. It's 33 to 10, Boston. They went. I've I had to put this. I know what you're talking about. I had to put this down. They went scoreless for six whole minutes in the third quarter. Scoreless. You have the MVP, a former scoring champion, a, fo- a former MVP, and you sc- you go scoreless for six whole minutes in a game seven. And it was close. A three point game at halftime. Right, it wasn't like it was a blowout the whole time. Like, right, no, it was. It was that game was winnable up until and, that the end right. of that third quarter. And then the Celtics got in the third quarter and just blew it wide open. Um, I'm gonna get off the Sixers case for a little bit and and make sure that I give my credit to the Celtics. That boy Jason Tatum broke Steph Curry's record. That it was only <laughs> up for two weeks. Fifty one points in a game seven, and they said he was a fraud. They said he ain't have it. They was trying to tell me Jalen Brown was better than him. Right. And <laughs> it he showed up. Matter. And look, this is again why I go back to Doc Rivers was trying. He was coaching. I saw P.J. Tucker on him. I saw mm-hmm. Jimmy Mellon on him. I saw Tobias on him. They were switching. They started trapping. He's doing everything he can as a coach. At some point, if you cannot stop this man from making a little side step three, I did, it don't matter, bro. I promise you it does not matter. It's not coaching. He's right. just in his bag. Literally. But- and, yeah, look, he, he took this game over completely. And it just was like – there was that stretch in the third quarter where I think he had two or three threes in a row, a couple of buckets, um, and, and Philly called a timeout. He turned to the crowd. He like, what? what and he's feeling it and i know a lot of it is probably because um look i know especially being a, a player in boston they probably were calling for his head after game six well he is lucky that they won that game listen he saved his entire legacy he <laughs> saved his whole career so far in that fourth quarter of that game six because it was if they lost that game it was going to get so bad for Jason Tatum and so it was going to get so bad. But uh, yeah, man, he just he just had it going. Like at that point, it was really nothing you could do. And that, honestly, that's that's really probably the biggest reason why I, I really like Tatum as a player is because not because um he obviously he's he's very talented. He can go out there and give you fifty, but it's the fact that even in like the game six. A lot of people can just stop shooting or like lose their confidence and just be like, all right, I don't got it tonight. Like, here you go, JB. Which I, sometimes I do feel like he needs to give JB the ball more when he doesn't have it going. So, to be fair, but um, he he just seems like he's just not rattled. Like, it doesn't matter how bad he's shooting. Doesn't matter how if he's turning the ball over. Like, like you said, he's still gonna play defense. He's still gonna rebound. He's still gonna do other things well. And eventually, once that shot does start falling again, it's over. Because yep. he he's he does not lose confidence, so a lot of credit goes to Jason Tatum. Yeah, fifty-one and thirteen with five assists and two steals, six for ten from three. Uh, he was three points shy of the of tying the Celtics record for most points in a playoff game. Uh, I think that's a, a John Havlicek John Havlicek record. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he was phenomenal. Did it with his mother courtside on Mother's Day. Uh, had to have been a special moment for him. Jalen Brown also was phenomenal in this game. He had 25, 25, 5 and 2 with two steals and two blocks. Um, huge energy plays on both sides of the ball. Timely buckets, um, especially again in that huge third quarter that they had that, that really helped blow the lead wide open. Um, Brogdon again is huge off the bench for them. Um, but 
look, the, the Celtics team was as much as we want to <laughs> to shade Joel for how bad he performed, especially in game six and game seven, you got to tip your cap to Al Horford and Robert Williams, like going big and putting those two in the starting lineup. They definitely were able to, to rattle him. Al Horford, I saw a strip Joel and beat. It felt like three or four different times, um, contest his shots as best he can and, and just body him up. And Al Horford seems he always has Embiid's number for years now. I don't understand it. He's the Embiid stopper, man. He is the <laughs> Embiid stop. He is Embiid's kryptonite. I don't get it, but hey, shout out to Al Horford, man. Uh, yeah, but having having both of them on the floor, letting Al again play that, you know, having the the main matchup on Embiid and having Rob able to rotate over and clog up the lane, be able to adjust shots at the rim, um, it was a great adjustment there by by Joe Missoula. Um, and was a huge reason why they were able to to close out this series here um, and get the win on their home floor in game seven. Um, the Celtics team is rolling. Jason Tatum is hot. I, you know, looking forward to the game tonight. I know we kind of already previewed their series in the last episode, so we don't have to go too deep into it. But, um, you know, obviously still no Tyler Hero. We're actually getting closer to the timeline of him being able to come back. I've seen speculation that, um, he may be able to come back potentially later in this series uh, from that, that broken hand injury. But again, a depleted heat team, Jimmy Butler, I'm sure is still dealing with that ankle injury. They look, the opportunity is there to go back to the finals and to, you know, write what went wrong for them last year. So mm-hmm. if Tatum is playing like this, it's going to be a hard team to stop because they're deep. Their top end talent between, you know, both the Jays is sensational. Um, and something that I think is interesting, right? Grant Williams was huge for them last year. He basically was like a, a no show in this playoffs, and not because he's not playing well, like he just isn't getting meaningful yeah. minutes. Mm-hmm. Grant Williams is probably the second best player off the Sixers bench if he was on the Sixers, besides the Anthony Mellon. The Anthony Mellon, yeah. That that just shows how how deep of a team the Celtics are, man. He's just he's not even playing, but on other teams, like I love to have Grant Williams, right? I love that Grant Williams on my team. So it just it, it just shows how how deep this team is, and how good this this rotation could be if need be. Going back to the Sixers one last time, um, look, like I said, this the Celtics made a lot of subtle adjustments, which. A lot of people may not have picked up on, but again, like they, they're trying to force Harden to go to his right. Again, like we said, they're putting uh, Al on um, Joel and letting him drop. They're having Rob Williams come come over and, and clog up the paint, which is making it hard for him to to kind of try to dominate the inside like he has been all season. Um, and they're kind of again with what they're giving up is that pocket pass to the mid range, but. Even on a lot of those, Al is doing a good job of, you know, dropping and recovering to get some type of decent contest on those. So um, they played the James Harden pick and roll really well, especially in game six and game seven. Um, so, again, credit to them there. But we, we can honestly transition this discussion right into these coaching firings, starting with, with Doc Rivers. But um, they, uh, they can Doc after this, this game. This is what is it, three years with Philly. Um, disappointing, you know. None, none of them reaching the the levels that they were this season. That they were predicted to this season in particular felt different. Felt like this was the team that was going to get over that hump. And uh, like I said, I, I I'll stand firmly on the fact that this is probably the the least or uh, how how I phrase it. Like the least oh, right. responsibility all this, he should right. take for it. Like it's compared to this other series that right. he, he basically blew. I, I yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Of all I the shortcomings that. that the Sixers has had, this one is least on Doc. Right, right. Because again, you have the MVP, you have Harden, you have again a great constructed roster around him. They have to show up. Doc mm. Rivers can't get on the court and post Joe up himself. Because I promise you, if he was the point guard. <laughs> he would have told him to get in the post. And I right. know he's trying to get him in the post, and it's obviously not as black and white as that, but at the end of the day, like we said, this in the postseason, the stars have to come up to play. 
and their stars completely went to I don't know where what they're doing. Now they're in Cancun. Yeah. Um I I agree. I think that this series isn't fully on Doc, but I also feel like he just needed to get out of there though. Like, yeah, I, he I might not like, be the right coach, but it yeah, it sucks when it feels like it's like a scapegoating because it's like, okay, we're gonna bring in a new coach. That's not gonna change the fact that this, I don't guys say I don't I don't care who is coaching this game. You're not winning this game with and beating hard and playing like this. I agree. I just I just feel like what can you really do besides fire the coach? You know what I mean? Like, what moves can you make? I think Harden potentially could be gone. So yeah. it's like, you're not trading him. He's a free agent. You know what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. like, what can you really do besides fire the coach? And especially when it's Doc Rivers in his history. It's like he's blown the most 3-1 leads in history. He's blown, I don't even know how many 3-2 leads. Like, it's just, <laughs> like, he had to go. I'm be honest, I might be a little biased. I'll admit that. I'm not really a fan of Doc Rivers. I never really was a fan of Doc Rivers. A lot of was... people aren't. And like I said, it's, it's his resume that makes people that way. He This is mm. – he's – look, if he ain't win that 08 championship for Boston, <laughs> boy, this would be a bad coaching resume he, from his time with the Clippers and now again here with, with the Sixers. If he ain't win that ring of 08 – He'd be doing podcasts like us, bro. <laughs> like this dude would not have a job, bro, if he didn't win that ring in 08, man. I think I like Doc Rivers is kind of like Mike McCarthy in football, bro. They are living off that one, that one ring. They are that's a wild are, dig at the Cowboys, man. My bad, hey. my bad. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But they are living off that one ring. Like, I get I think they are ab- above average coaches. Like, I've seen something that said, like, they feel like Doc Ray, Doc Rivers is like a floor raiser. But not like a ceiling raiser, and I, I a player's guy. Yeah, he's a player. Yeah, coach. exactly. I think he can get you to the playoffs. You know, what I mean, he can get you to the second round. But like, I'm I'm just not a fan of Doc Rivers. I just think he's an above average to average coach, and that like that's it. Like, I don't mm-hmm. think he's really this great all time coach. That like, it seems like people look at him that way. Besides the people that obviously don't really like him that much, but he keeps getting jobs. I mean. I don't know. He has respect around the league, which obviously some of that is warranted. But I don't know. I'm I'm just not a huge fan of Doc Rivers. I'm being completely honest. So I, I think the change was needed, but also I agree with what you're saying. It's like not. I don't think any coach really in that situation would have won that game when your two best players are playing that bad. Right. Uh, and hold hey. on. how do you how do you feel about a? <laughs> it's crazy because they played so bad. But you saw his comments after the game, like Joel Embiid's comments. Like, yeah, me and James can't can't do it by ourselves or something like that. It got it got taken out of context. I don't remember what account tweeted it out first. Both the like the just like the text of it of it, and then the mm-hmm. video. Both of those are wild, wildly clipped. Like the fact mm-hmm. that you, the whole answer was like two minutes. Why did you? They got like cut the whole beginning and middle out and That's framed it up in a way that was like. Oh my gosh! I need help. Me, me and James, <laughs> we don't have nobody helping us. That's not how it really came off, because he's the answer started with him obviously saying like, "I have to play better." Like he put the onus on himself and James mm. too. But, um, but at the end of the day, <laughs> Tobias Harris was your leading scorer. I, oh my gosh, PJ Tucker scored more than James he was. Harden. Listen, I PJ Tucker had more in the first quarter than James Harden had in the whole game. P.J. Tucker shows up to play, man. Greatest role player of our generation. We already talked about this, man. Game seven, he lives for these. P.J. lives for these. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that, that's bad. He can't outscore James Harden. That's ridiculous. Right. Um, but, yeah, I think the the comment got taken a little bit too far out of context. But even with it, you know, being the, the full statement that it is, like watching it in its entirety, bro, I don't got nobody to put the blame on but the two of y'all. Right. Every people, other people showed up. Like I said, you got eleven out of PJ. That's a lot. That he listen, goes, that's he a, goes that's, multiple games without taking a shot. You got eleven points say, <laughs> That's eleven points unaccounted for because you were not counting him to score any. All right. Tobias had nineteen. Maxi did not shoot great, but he still gave you seventeen. Like mm-hmm. we need you to <laughs> to be stepping up and not combining for twenty four. We need more like sixty. Literally. out of our two MVP caliber players. And these in these the biggest games of the season. 
I don't care what the role players do. You, your your two main players have to show up. Your best players have to show up. So it's like, to me, they get majority of the blame. I don't care if Maxi went 0 for 15. I don't care if Tobias scored two points. You guys are the best player on this team. Now, if you guys both had 35 and a right. 15, 35 and no one else came to play, then I get what you're saying. But mm-hmm. you guys didn't show up. You guys get most of the blame. Exactly. And uh, going back to your point about you saying that, you're not a huge fan of Doc. A lot of his former players aren't either. Because <laughs> um, I saw mm-hmm. J.J. Reddick came out. And he threw some shade at Doc because I think he, he had came out and they, they were asking him about his, some of his Clippers teams, and they said that they weren't – I forgot what the word they used. Like, uh, basically, like they weren't completely together um, and coherent uh, and, and playing as a unit. And so J.J. Reddick just tweeted out, well, is that why y'all lost this game? Um, and I think even Rasheed Wallace, who played with him in Boston, was like, he, he, he was like, he doesn't make adjustments. You know, they need to get a different guy in there. So Paul said, George your, says something like that. Right. To your, something similar. to your point, I, it's well known around the league. Like he's a, a locker room guy, a player's coach guy. He regularly gets out coached, but I think he, he tried his darndest to, to do what he could. But again, I, like we said, 51 from Tatum was, it didn't matter who was on him. Right. There's nobody on the Sixers team could have stopped him. No coverage was stopping him. They tried going zone. Like they did, they ran everything that they could out of the playbook. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but getting into this larger conversation, because it wasn't just Doc that got fired. Since we last recorded, Monty Williams also got canned in Phoenix. Man. Both of these teams, and I didn't even, I completely forgot, uh, the Sixers, I think, are under new ownership too. Um, obviously, Matt Ishbia there in Phoenix taking over. Um, but the, uh, the the Phoenix is now, I believe, not the uh, the Sixers, I believe, are now under new new owners as of I don't remember when. I think somewhere somewhere recently they have some new ownership, but um, or they have a new new majority ownership stake. Either way, typically when new owners come in, they always want to make big sweeping changes. Again, we saw with Matt Ishbia, he came in right before the trade deadline and called Josiah himself and got right. KD to Phoenix. Mm-hmm. And then after you put together <laughs> D-Book and KD with the injuries that they had and the lack of depth, throwing them out there with a bunch of bench players in, in that game six, and you get, again, embarrassed for the second year in a row on your home floor. Again, I want to know, what could any coach have done differently in that situation? What could any coach take take it out of that game? Because I know we're talking about just this game seven with Doc. Mm-hmm. What coach could have won that series for Phoenix? Who would have won this series? Like, like I said, with, with Doc, we're talking about who would have won game seven with mm-hmm. the way that Joel and, and Harden played. But looking at Monty, like what coach could you have put in there that would have won you this series? I don't think no. anybody, right? They're just y'all. No overmatched from a talent or overmatched from a depth perspective, right? Mm-hmm. They're it's taking 90 plus points almost between your two best players to even be competitive to win these games. If they have an off night, y'all are getting blown out the building. So right. that one, I really don't understand four seasons in Phoenix, two time coach of the year brought them to a finals a lot of people don't remember before he, I think he raised their win total every single year, except for this past year, um, mm-hmm. obviously being the number one seed uh, last season. Um, and when he got there, this was a 30 win team. And then they went to the bubble and went eight and O oh, and completely changed the culture, changed the narrative, changed how the media views the Suns. He helped change the narratives around Devin Booker. They were trying yeah. to say that he was an empty stat guy. Right, and empty stats on a bad team. Bro, I get it when uh, when sometimes you feel like you need a change. You need like you just need to change the culture. This is not one of those cases. Like you didn't need to change like I didn't see a reason to fire Monty Williams. Like I I understand you're a new owner. <clears throat> Excuse me, you're a new owner. So a lot of owners like they want their guys. Like I want to get my guy. But when your guy is the guy for the job, it's like why do you need to get your guy when this guy is working for you? Like the past three seasons, he had he, they were fifty one and twenty one. That was the year they went to the finals, and then there were the the number one seed. With they won sixty four games. Yep, 
64 games. And then they still had – they won 45 games, but this is when they had Devin Booker hurt for a lot of this season. They had KD hurt even when they got him in the trade. It's like, what can you really do? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, like, I, I just – it does not make sense to me because Monty is a good coach. I don't really know of – unless I don't know about, like, problems behind the scenes, I don't really know of any problems besides the one with, like, DeAndre Ayton. But who cares about DeAndre Ayton? Like, besides the ones with DeAndre Ayton, like, they seem like most of the players liked playing for Monty. He obviously is a good coach. He like you said, the, he brought you to the finals, mm-hmm. and it's like he got you out of this like poverty that you were in. Like he was the re- he was the main reason why you guys were a, a contending, a good playoff caliber yeah. team. So it's like I, I don't get it, and it's like they're trying to solve their problems with stuff that's not going to fix their actual problems. If that makes sense, it's like your problem wasn't coaching, like. You didn't get thoroughly out coached and like, okay, that was the reason why we lost. Let's just change the coach and we'll right. be back next year. Like, no. Problem guys, is campaign was your best player in game six. Exactly. You guys did not have a good enough team. Denver was easily a better team than you guys. You guys did not have a good enough team to compete. Monty didn't, doesn't even have bodies to try to make adjustments. Like, what adjustments can he make when you ha- are playing with two players, Kevin Durant and Devin Booker? Right. Like, what adjustments can you make? Exactly. So, I just feel like they're trying to solve their problems with – just, I don't know, like, there's just stuff that just, it doesn't make sense. It really That's, doesn't make sense. It, it bothers me more because it's, again, an instance where an owner is coming in and he wants to have his fingerprints on everything, mm-hmm. not just from a business perspective, but he wants to get his hands in the basketball side of things when there are people whose job it is to do that. James right. Jones is the GM for a reason. I don't need you as the owner coming in and calling another owner to get a trade done. He's very because, impatient. Right, because what happened now? We have no depth. What is the biggest reason you would say the Suns lost this series? They don't have any depth or <laughs> right. defender, which they traded away in the trade, right? right. So this is an instance where we're going to sit here and blame – I'm talking about from an internal perspective for the Suns, because I think most people were shocked that this happened because all of us can see it for what it is. Y'all are going to sit here and blame Monty Williams for this roster. What was he supposed to do? Right. Put it on the owner that made the phone call. Because, look, I'm sure there was a lot of big media people that had the Suns as this huge championship contender, had them as, you know, being the Nuggets in this series. We were never – neither of us were either of those people. I had Mm -hmm. very little confidence in the Suns team because who do they turn to outside of D-Book and KD? Nobody. I don't trust Aiden, Chris Paul, and then he got hurt, right? So it's like they do not have what it currently takes to get out of the second round against this Nuggets team. They Even if they would have got to the next round, I don't think they would have what it takes to beat this Lakers team. Lakers team is so much deeper than that. They have different problems that present. Who was going to stop AD? Like, it would not have mattered. Um, and so the, the fact that you fire a guy, like you already said, and who came in and completely changed the, the culture for your team, changed how your team is perceived across the league, is honestly, it's pretty pathetic. Um, because now you're going to bring in a new guy who, again, like there are so many other problems that the bringing in a new coach isn't going to change. The roster, I think, is the paramount issue here. And it doesn't matter who that next person is for Phoenix. They still have so many roster questions that have to get answered before they are even thought about being a serious contenders again because they need to add more depth. They need to figure out what they're going to do with Aiden. They need to figure out what they're going to do with CP3. Like, firing money was not the problem here. And it, it, if anything, I feel like it's just going to make the problems worse because now, again, you're starting from scratch when you had a team who was so close once already and like, yes, back-to-back years, they bow out in embarrassing fashion this year. I wouldn't even really like, I don't think it would have mattered. Like, I think they were going to lose the series anyway. It just was bad that they lost it that way. The Dallas one. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was really bad. Um, But, you know, in this particular instance, right? Like, I think I was listening to Through the Wire and and Kenny brought it up and he was like, you know, there was a time back when LeBron was on the heat where after that first loss, you know, to, to, um, to Dallas in the finals, you know, he wants Spolstra gone 
and Pat Riley and, and you know the internal stakeholders there were like, no, we're we're keeping our guy. We like Spo. We're keeping Spo. And look what that turned out to. Like right. he's a a cornerstone of the franchise. Their culture is the biggest thing that we talk about year in and year out. And so much of that is due to him. And not only just the fact that he's there, but the continuity that he's been there for so long. Mm -hmm. Like he started out as a video coordinator for them. He worked his way up to becoming the head coach, you know, and now has been the guy for them for whatever. It's going on like 20 years now, probably soon. Um, Monty struggled early. So did Spolstra. Like Spo had his struggles. And it's like, you're not even giving these coaches a chance to like fully get their time to get everything situated and implement their ideas and their culture and their strategies. And like, we're just basing everything on like one or two playoff series realistically. Um, And it's like, we just pull the plug on it. It feels like the NFL where it's like, you bring guys in for a season with a bad roster. They win two games. It's like, oh, this guy sucks. Let me get him out of here. It's like, right. what did you want them to do? There's no line, no there's no D line, no defense. Quarterback is young. Like, who, who was going to win games with this team? You could have brought Vince Lombardi in from the dead. It wouldn't have mattered, right? Like, right. So, I, like, owners have got to got to be more patient because even in the media and like as a whole, coaches are always going to get heavily criticized, and some of that is unwarranted um, because again, like you said, like. The, the players sometimes get off too easy. Like, end of the day, they can't go out there and make the shots. They can't go out there and run the sets. So it's like, if the players aren't executing, like the coaches can be making adjustments. We don't know what's going on behind closed doors, but um, like, I, I promise you at the NBA, all these coaches are trying. Some of them are obviously better at it than others, but like we can see in instances where like teams are trying new things. But it's like, at the end of the day, your roster, you just run out of adjustments to make. It's just like, I, I've got nothing else to throw at this team that we haven't already tried and we know doesn't work, you know? So yeah. I don't get the Monty one. Uh, the Doc Rivers one, I think, is a little bit more warranted. But again, in this, looking at it from this perspective after this game, like this series is not on him, you know? So I, I think as a whole, the league just needs to to give more more time to these coaches to really like have a fair crack at it. Yeah, I, I agree with pretty much everything you said. It's really the patience thing. That's the biggest thing for me because I understand you're a new owner. Like, like you want your guy. You know, you want to change. You go. We want to come in and change stuff up. Like you said, put your fingerprints on it. But it's like sometimes that's just not what's needed. Like, I understand if you fire a guy that's like having his struggles. Like, maybe you don't really see like the future being great for this coach. But it's like Monty already got them to the finals. It's not like he's a coach that just he's struggling he's trying to find his way like he's i could say he's a proven good mm-hmm. coach right now so you're gonna bring in somebody who and it was up, he's a good they coach. were up 2-0 in that final right if i remember correctly yes exactly right. they were up 2-0 so it's like maybe things going a, a different way maybe they win that final you never know like you know what i mean like he's a he's a good coach so it's like firing him just because you want your guy it doesn't really make sense to me when you know the guy that's already there is a good coach and the reason why you guys got bounced were was not his fault. So that to me just doesn't make sense. Um, like you said, the Suns really they really just need to get depth. That's their main thing. And it's funny, it's funny because I seen a report today talking about James Harden is interested in going to the Suns. I did I'm like, see that. I'm like, bro, we're gonna do this all over again. Are we bro, really gonna do this? If again? we're gonna if we're gonna pair up any other OKC teammates, we need to get Westbrook on the Suns. We've yeah. tried every pairing again over <laughs> and over, combining Harden and KD, right. and we tried Westbrook and Harden and Houston. Like, right. just put the original duo back together. And He's I don't a know, free let, agent. All right, let's see their art go full circle because, mm-hmm. I don't know, stop. That would at least be fun. It'd be a nice right. little story, but yeah. that's not – even then, that's not what they need. Like, right. it's crazy yeah. because just knowing now how the owner operates – I would not be surprised if that actually happens. He, like, he's just like, oh, yeah, star power. Like, let's just let's bring James Harden in. Like, that's not what you need, bro. That's not why you lost because you are you need another scoring guard. That's not what you need, bro. Right. But, so there are a ton of coaching vacancies. Coaches of the year is getting fired left or right. I feel like it's going to be like a carousel, right? Like Nick Nurse, I think, is going to get hired. Bud is probably going to get hired. Monty mm-hmm. Williams, I think, is definitely going to get hired. So it's like <laughs> all these guys that just got fired 
all about to just get picked up by teams that just fired their coach. Like, <laughs> they're just trading coaches around all over the place. The only one that I think probably won't get a job right away is probably going to be Doc. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, like, I've seen – and now that Doc is gone, I've seen that J.J. Reddick is – considered a favorite by some sports gambling site to be the, the new head coach in Philly. I don't buy into it that much, but yeah. it, there's a lot of, a lot of shakeup going on around the league. And, and some people have speculated that part of it is because of how many good coaches are out on the market right now with Nick nurse and bud and, um, and Monty too. Now, especially that teams are a little bit more hesitant or not hesitant, a little bit more ready to, to, you know, maybe cut ties with a coach sooner to bring in some one of those other guys like Nick Nurse or Monty, um, who kind of has a track record of being a good coach. Um, Nick Nurse obviously being a championship winning coach as well. So, yeah, look at the end of the day, that owner's got to stick to the business side, man. You leave the leave the basketball to the people that you hired to do that side of things because now you just tied your hands and put yourself in a tough spot because of it. Literally. Have you have you seen the uh people talking about like the Bucks and Eastern are like interested in Ty Lu? I'm like, bro, isn't he like already coaching? Like, why is I don't I don't get that. Do they think he's gonna get fired or something? Like, I don't understand. I never understood that. But I've seen I've seen that like a lot like recently. Like, oh yeah, the Bucks are interested in Ty Lu. Yeah, I don't know what they would be able to do. I know that you can like you do know, some interesting interesting things with coaching contracts and like some like basically like, essentially like sign and trade type of things. Mm. Um, other than that, like, obviously I think he would have to get like fired from, or like have some mutual split, whatever with, with the Clippers to get out. But yeah. look at them. If Milwaukee was able to get Ty Lue, oh my gosh, you go from, a, again, a coach who is great at setting up his schemes in the beginning of the season and implementing everything that's not great at game to game adjustments to going to maybe one of, if not the best game to game right. to coach <laughs> in Ty Lue, which I think would be very smart for Milwaukee to do because we've seen that that is where they struggled specifically in this last series against Miami and had been kind of a, a theme across Bud's time in Milwaukee. So that would be a huge get if they were able to pull that one off. That would be very interesting to see a Giannis, a Ty Lue coach, Giannis-led team. Um, and, the, and the Clippers would lose Ty Lue. Oh yeah, I'm for that. <laughs> I'm all for that. Oh man, uh, got to touch on one other thing that is disappointing. Um, and I, they they interviewed Adam Silver about it yesterday at the draft lottery. Um, obviously, this past weekend, John Morant was on IG Live with a gun again. Um, I got to get this out the way first before we, we really get into it. But whoever sat there, and this is this is this isn't even on his Instagram. This is on one of his friends' IG lives. Mm -hmm. Whoever sat there in that live, because there was only about a hundred people in there. Whoever sat there and was screen recording, bro, you're a clown. Yeah, that is weird. Mad weird. That bro. is some <laughs> weird, weird, lame behavior from you, like. What type of snitching is this? Like, you <laughs> like and you're I, just you're screen recording, hoping something's gonna happen, hoping something's gonna happen. Like, right? Bro, come on, bro. Like, that's just that's weird. Are that's you watching weird. him like that? You just that's just clown lame behavior for me. I seen the original tweet. He tagged ESPN, TMZ, Bleacher. <laughs> I'm like, bro, you're so weird. But like, what? Why do you care that much? Right. Like, I get it. Like, he shouldn't have been doing it. I understand. You, I get it. You found something cool, but it's like. And what do you even gain from that? Nothing. At like, all. what do you what do you gain? Nobody nobody knows you, bro. Right. It, that's so weird. childish and lame. I had to get out the way before before we even talk about anything job related because I feel like that's going under the rug too much. Like, bro, mm. you're weird. Um, but watching the video, right? You see, it's him and his boy. He puts the camera on Jod and whatever. Listen to the young boy. <laughs> Jod pulled a gun out. His boy put the camera down. Like. And I'm tired of people. I'm t listen. I'm tired of people blaming his boy. His boy was. He was trying listen, to cover for him. He was trying to help, bro. Out. He was trying to help, bro. Out. Listen. It's like, I see. He seen the camera originally. Right. Seen the camera. Like, all right, cool. We on you like da 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 da. Flips it back to me. Now I flip it back to you. You whipped the gun out. Like, what? Come. What are you? 
you doing, right, bro? He, like he's literally here like this, and I said, "Yo, bro, chill, bro." Like ex- exactly. On. And then I got and I see people over here like, "Oh, why is his friends always recording?" This is his friend's IG live for himself. Right. He, why can't he record himself? Like he John Morant is a grown man. Ain't nobody put the gun in his hand but him. Exactly. And you see, I would get if you didn't see that he was on live, but like, bro, you seen he was on right. live already. He was in the camera, like hype, listening to the young boy, and then he flipped it back, and then flipped it back to you, and you decided like, yeah, let me really show him. Like, bro, what are you, bro? He's an idiot, bro. I'm sorry, he's an idiot. Like, yeah, and you could if you if you watch the interview with uh, Adam Silver last night, the draft lottery, it was very apparent to him that it 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 almost Adam Silver came off like hurt like because he was yeah. like we talked about this already and i genuinely like he sold to me that like he understood what he did before was a bad look for him bad look for the league he understood the consequences of it he understand the messaging that that sends out for a, a up-and-coming superstar who has such a young fan base of following right like it to me to adam silver right he's saying like to him it felt like he knew the consequences that he was going to make real meaningful change and this is like a slap in the face right like clearly that conversation meant nothing to you Mm -hmm. that eight game suspension meant nothing to you that time you took off like all that seems performative now you just did it and like obviously to an extent like yeah you have to say certain things you know what you have to do the apology all that stuff you got to check those boxes but then when you check those boxes and then go and do it again it's like all right bro you really don't care because it's like bro you got a signature shoe with nike you know how many great NBA players in history never had a signature shoe? Exactly. You put that on the line. You got a uh, a deal with Powerade. You the new face of Powerade. You put that on the line. You just cost yourself a Supermax extension because you didn't make All-NBA. You probably would have had you not had this happen during the season. $39 million you missed out on. Right. 30... Bro. And now you're looking at another – Pretty lofty suspension, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I've seen people talk Mm -hmm. about, you know, he didn't break any laws and any of the incidents. And, like, all that is fair and true. I completely agree. Like, look, it's (laughs) politicians be showing guns. Like, gun culture is a thing, right? Um, So, like, that is can be true. But at the same time, bro, Bro, you're representing the NBA. You're representing the Grizzlies. You're representing Nike. You're representing Powerade. Like, they have the, the you know, it's the ball is in their court whether they want to work with you or not. So you cannot get, you know, under any legal trouble. You don't have to get any other, any criminal trouble. All these organizations can be like, man, this is a bad look for us. We don't want right. to continue to work with you. You don't have to break the law to get fired from your, like, to get fired from your job. Like, if yeah. your employer feels like you're making us look bad or you're doing something that we don't like, they can fire you if they want to. You don't, it doesn't have to be something that breaks the law. Exactly. Like, so, like, I, yeah, I like I said, I get what you're saying, but it's like they still have the right to suspend you mm-hmm. and like punish you for this act, even if it's not technically breaking the law. And that's why I feel like, bro, it's just, it's just dumb on his part because it's like, even, all right. Even if you don't understand the me representing the league, me representing this company, that company, like you said, the power raid, the Nike, all that stuff. Even if you're just like selfish to the point where like, bro, I don't care about none of that. You're still costing yourself. Like you're costing yourself money. Like millions. Millions. Thirty nine million. You cost yourself thirty nine million. That's off of what you're not going to get from the extension alone. That's not even talking about the, the cash that you missed for missing those games. The cash that you about to miss. For the games you were about to get suspended for. That's why it's dumb because it's like you're already dumb for like not realizing who you are as far as like I'm working with Nike. Like you said, having a signature shoe, working with Powerade, this, that, and the third. You're already dumb for like putting that in jeopardy. But you're also dumb, like 39. I keep saying it, but that's a lot of money, bro. Yeah. $39 million is a lot of money to miss out on. I don't care how rich you are. You're not passing up a $39 million. Exactly. So it's like he just it's just dumb. And it's what and what is it for? Like to look cool, like on Instagram. Like I don't get yeah. like what's the reason and like you're just trying to look cool. Like you're people already like you have fans already. People already look up to you. Like you're an NBA superstar, bro. Like people already look up to you. Like what do you need yeah. to be like? 
a gangster for. Like, I don't, I don't get that part. That doesn't make sense to me. Right. And I'm not about to try to sit here and speculate. I've seen people try to do it, and I think it's it's not worth the conversation about like, oh, he didn't grow up like that. Like, bro, I don't know him. I don't know where he's from. Like, even if he did, it's dumb. Background. Right. Even that, if he that's did, all, like, who that's cares? That's what you can say. Is like, I'm not gonna talk about his family. I'm not gonna talk about. I see people try to talk about his dad team. Like, oh, he need to brace him better. Like, bro, I'm not about to go into none of that because I don't know that relationship. Right. I don't know his upbringing. What I do know. It's you're an NBA player, and it's no need for an NBA player to be doing this or trying to portray that image. You don't have to live that life, even if that was a life that you used to live. Bro, you're in the league. You're good. I promise you're good. Because it's, it's people that do need to live that life every day. They're not in the league. It's, it's you know two what's crazy different too? sides of the world. I don't, and I, you, I don't really see a lot of people talking about this, but like, Bro is putting himself in danger. Like that, like, regardless of all the stuff he's costing, like, there's people who act, like you said, there's people who actually live that life that was like, I right. think he's tough. Like, let me try you. Like exactly. You're putting yourself in danger. You know what I'm saying? So like it's crazy how I don't really see a whole lot of people talking about about that. But like that's all. No, I've seen people say that. Like, uh <laughs> I mean, like, I've seen a lot of people say it, but I even saw Stephen A. Smith was on his podcast. Like, mm-hmm. he's like, it's nothing more than people that that get like that than seeing people who they know aren't cut from that cloth doing that. Right. Because that's like a slap in the face to them. Because again, like mm-hmm. they're living that life. Because this, that's how they have to. That's all right. They have to do that on a day to day. Bro, you're an NBA star. You don't need to get involved in any of this. So what is this, a game to you? Right. right? Like, so mm-hmm. it's a bad look all around. Um, yeah. I, look, I, I'm always going to wish well for everybody. So I hope he, if the last one wasn't the wake up call, this one I hope is a wake up call because, bro, if the leash was short already, like I think you're out of leashes. Like the next one is like, you, we got to start be looking at teams are gonna want to be done. Yeah, right. I've seen, bro, I've it's seen not stuff worth like, the headache. Mm-hmm. I've, yeah, I've seen stuff like that. It's like, at what point are you bringing it to the level of like, we need we need to get rid of Ja. Like I don't think it's at that level yet. We're approaching like, it. You're getting pretty close, and obviously, it's not click. Something is not clicking. You know what I mean? Like you would think the first time, it'd be like, all right, let me, you know, what I mean, let me chill out. Then you do it again. It's like something's clearly not clicking. So like, mm-hmm. if he say he gets suspended for what half the season, longer or whatever, if something else happens after that, he might be up out of there. Because this and it isn't just the guns on IG live stuff. It's the Problem with the, the seventeen year old kid, right. or allegedly, I'm not. I don't. Mm-hmm. I didn't really do any research with that, so I'm not gonna say what happened and what didn't happen. I don't know at all. But I'm just saying allegedly, like what was it beating up a seventeen year old at a park or something like yeah. that? It was something at like a mall with like mm-hmm. his I mom and a security guard. The, a security so guard. Even yeah. if all of these stories are like whatever, it's like alleged, like. Stuff isn't always fully corroborated. Again, nothing's ever been criminal charges, you know, put mm-hmm. against him. Just the simple fact that you keep getting brought up in all these situations is a problem, bro. It's a problem. Mm-hmm. Like, you do not need to be getting mixed up in any of this, bro. You don't need to be getting mixed up in anything like this. And like, like I said, like, again, it's people who really get like that, that are also in the NBA. Like, I listened to DeJounte Murray talk about his life and his upbringing, talking about he was in and out of juvie all throughout high school, running the streets, doing all this stuff. Bro, you don't see him get in none of this. And he mm-hmm. actually, like, again, I don't know Ja's background, his upbringing, but, like, I know DeJounte Murray talked about, like, he really was about this. He don't get no type of off the court drama, nothing. The biggest off the court drama was that him and Paolo had beef. All right. <laughs> that was it. That's because he thought his head was getting too big after he was the number <laughs> one overall pick. That's it, bro. All he do is who. So I, I look, I, I don't understand that. I hope he gets it sorted out because he's too big, too good of a talent to just see it all go to waste over something as stupid and meaningless as this, bro. Exactly. That's the biggest part. Meaningless. Like all you're doing all of this for no what you're not gaining anything. You're really not. What are you gonna gain? Street cred? 
Oh, you're an NBA superstar. No, you're nobody going to give NBA you no NBA. street credit for nobody, this, bro. I'm about to say, and people are still not even giving you that because everyone's just saying you're not really from that life. So it's like, All right. you're not even, you're not doing yourself any favors. But hey, Memphis, they changing the culture, though. They got Dylan Brooks out of there. They changed the culture, though. <laughs> <laughs> they changing the culture over there. Oh, man. Well, look, to, to switch over to a lighter note and get back to, to who specific talk. Uh, Last big piece of news that came out since we last recorded, uh, we touched on earlier, the draft lottery happened last night. I don't think I've ever been so excited to watch a, a draft lottery <laughs> in my life. Um, the first, what, six picks all went according to how the, you know, the, the percentages were, how the rankings were. Everything goes according to plan. That man opened a fifth envelope, and the Pistons slid from one to five. Oh, my God. God, they won 17 games and are going to pick fifth. That's so bad, bro. Oh, I would be so hurt I'd, if I was a Pistons fan. I'd be absolutely pissed, bro. We tanked. We had our best our best player not play the whole season mm-hmm. just so we can get a shot. Right. And we had the odds. Like, that's the main thing. We had the odds yep. for it. And not even second. Like, we slid to five. Bro. Five, bro. <laughs> You they gonna miss out on Wemby. You missing out on school. school. I've seen people. They might miss out on both Thompson twins. Like exactly. And and uh yeah exactly yeah they gonna miss out on both Thompson twins probably. Wow, that's yeah. I'd be pissed. Uh, so they go into the top four. The Rockets fall from. You know they had they were tied for the top three odds. They fall to four. The Blazers jump up to three, which. Puts them in a very interesting spot because mm-hmm. they have options now, right? Like, you're still so committed to Dame, you probably get a real nice package around getting that third pick. Yep. If you're not committed to Dame, you could trade Dame for another nice young package and some draft capital and use the third pick. And now you're pairing up Anthony Simons with whoever, you know, comes out mm-hmm. of this. Like, if the Hornets don't take Scoot, which I think would be crazy, but, like, this might like that. You could get a Thompson twin, Brandon Miller, whatever. Cam Whitmore, whatever the case is. Um, It's like there's a lot of options there. Like I said, the Hornets get the number two pick. But the Wemby Yama sweepstake, (laughs) it felt like it's destiny. Man is coming to San Antonio. They just can't miss on these number one picks when it's a big. Oh, my gosh. Pop sold his soul, man. (laughs) This is the way you go from David there, Robinson to Tim Duncan. So you get Wimby. Come on, man. That is, I mean, I, I don't like it's crazy because I see a lot of people that don't like the Spurs because of the dynasty and how a lot of people just don't like when teams win constantly. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't like that doesn't affect me nothing. Like I don't really care. So like I think it's cool that he's going to the Spurs, getting a good coach, you know what I mean? But yep. there was a lot of people that was pissed. <laughs> that was real. People bad. were gonna say it was rigged no matter where he that went. Because you could have yeah. you could have crafted up some type of storyline. And if any team outside of like the top seven got him, they're like, oh my gosh, it's rigged. It, it wouldn't mm-hmm. matter. But um him going to the Spurs, I hit up my old boss instantly. I was like, yo, let's go. Like <laughs> I I'm I gotta. I'm going to like 10 plus for a game this year. This is crazy. <laughs> um, but realistically looking at what that, you know, presents to the Spurs, they already had a, honestly, an exciting young core with guys who developed really well. The Spurs development team um, was phenomenal. I still have a lot of, you know, guys that I'm close with on, on both the business side and the basketball side of things, and they do it the right way over there. Um and so you're adding to a team that already had, you know, all rookie Jeremy Sohan, got Devin Vassell, you've got Kelvin Johnson, um, and now you're best about to insert Wembin Yama into that lineup. That's crazy. Oh, my gosh. I cannot wait until Summer League. I cannot wait until Summer League because I need to summer see Summer League this. is about to be, oh, my. I always like watching Summer League. I always like watching Summer League. This one? It's about to be crazy because not not even just for women. Yama, I don't even care rap. if he get the Zion treatment. And he only play one game, or whatever. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I need to see this. <laughs> the the rating, the TV ratings for the Spurs are about to go through the roof. They we talked. Listen, we talked about it. Whoever gets Wimby, you're not just like 
it's way more than just basketball. Like you're right. gonna make so much money. Mm-hmm. The city that that he goes to is just gonna be up. It's like, wow, that's crazy. He's he's in the, the Spurs <laughs> with Pop. I don't know if you saw the clip. They uh they had some like draft lottery party at some bar downtown in San Antonio. And they was I had pop champagne bottles and they was I peep, yeah. I'm like, yo, you would have thought they won the chip. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I would listen, I'd be if I was a Spurs fan, I'd be just as happy, bro. I'd be just as happy. Cause bro, this kid is really different. Like he could really turn out to be like an all-time great if he doesn't get injured, like as far as just his skill set, being seven foot four, being able to like be that good in the perimeter, being able to shoot, rim protect, bro. Nah, he he especially that's why I'm happy he went to the Spurs. I feel like they're gonna do a good job of making sure that he turns into the player that he should be. And right. just hope just hope and pray that like because he's so tall, no injuries happen, nothing derails his career. So if he stays in the right track, he definitely could be like an all-time great. Yeah, I think it like fit-wise, outside of like on the court, like again, just from an organizational perspective, like the Spurs have the track record. Like with big men, with international players, like mm. this felt like the perfect fit for him to go and, and get developed and start his NBA career. He put out pictures, um, you know, obviously being from France, like he has a good good relationship with Tony Parker. Put out pictures of him from since he was a kid in Spurs jerseys. It, it just seemed like it's fate, right? Yeah, right. Um, so yeah, I think he he just getting to the basketball perspective, it's just going to unlock so much of the development that we've already seen from Keldon and Devin Vassell. Um, and then him and Jeremy Sohan are going to be a great one-two punch on the defensive side of the ball, um, you know, from rim protection and, and obviously being 7-4, 7-5, uh, but Sohan already being a versatile defender that he is, and we saw this past season. Um they have got something cooking in San Antonio, man. They had one national TV game this past year. That's probably going up to about 10, 11 or so. Right. They're going to they get the Lakers treatment. They're going to be on national <laughs> TV every other night. Right. Uh, but, yeah, man, I am just – I'm so excited for him to come into the league. So excited for him and Scoot, honestly, like two generational type, you know, talent guys to, to come in um, and just – continue to bring in more and more talent to the league because it is it's crazy we've never seen it. and even when they like they're showing the highlight reel of him after the lottery it's like i've watched his games i watch film it's like every mm. time it's just like you see something different it's just like bro what is that they doubling you at the three-point line you just spun out of the double team at seven foot five huh bro. is this 2k bro what am i watching like bro this man shot a step back three-pointer Missed it, came in the frame, got a put back dunk on his own step back three point. Like, you realize how crazy that is for a normal person he's to a, do that? He's like an a, alien. He's like an alien. He's seven foot. Hey, not like if he was a standstill, you know it's going to miss. You're going to run and get your rebound. Right. Step back, you come back into the frame and get a put back dunk. It's not, he's, bro, he's not human. There's no way. He's not human. So I'm excited. Um, like we said, I hope and pray if I, like the Hornets take school because if they don't, I feel like that's just dumb. I feel like he's a number one pick caliber player. Right. Just Any happened, other year. Yeah, like he just happened to be, you know, in this draft. So All right. Um, like you said, I'm I'm real interested to see what the Blazers do because th- this will determine what the, a direction they're really going in. Because they say this mm-hmm. one thing, oh yeah, we're trying to win, we're trying to compete, and their absence could be something completely different. So right. it's like this will show. Are you trying to win? Because you can get a good player to pair alongside Dame. Or are you just going to say, all right, we're just going to go full rebuild and trade Dame? So, I, because I, I feel like if you don't trade this pick, you're basically telling Dame, you're like, look, we're not serious. Like, we're wasting your prime, bro. We're not serious. So, all right. Um, yeah, I think that's the biggest storyline in the draft. Like, because outside of the lottery, just to figure out who was going to take Wimby, that mm-hmm. I think has put them in the most interesting slot, like you said, to really – put their money where their mouth is. If they really want to build around Dame, I don't think you keep that pick. So, all right. Say say the Blazers had got the first overall pick. Does Damian Lillard stay? They draft with me. Does, I don't feel like you're passing up on Wimby. I feel like whoever yeah, you can't. The pick, you cannot pass up on Wimby. Does Damian Lillard stay? Because, like, 
that's like in between like we're trying to build for the future and we're trying to compete because if this kid is really as good as like people say he is with right. Damian Lillard like you could compete I would say right exactly what I would say you stay and if he comes in on the hype that he even if it's 70 percent of what they're talking him up to be mm-hmm. um like that is a dynamic duo, really. <laughs> right. Um, right. And and if it's not, you can always request a trade and like wash your hands at the All Star break, right? And you still have mm-hmm. Wimby. You're gonna get a nice haul for Dame, and just you know start and build around him and Anthony. So um, if that would have happened, I think there's no losing in that situation. But here they have a, a for real decision to make around Dame's future, whether they keep him, trade him keep the pick, trade the pick. But for once in his entire career, I would like to – we're not even that, but really in the last, like, three, four seasons, I would like to see the Blazers say something and back it up and just do it the right way and don't keep trying to play this in between and we're going young and then there's no great players around Dane. Like, pick a road and go down that path. They keep walking that line. Old. You can't yeah. have both. They keep they keep walking that line. It's it's it sucks because like I feel bad for Damian Lillard because I would love to see him actually compete for a ring, like a real team who can actually contend. And he's so loyal, he doesn't want to leave. But at some point, bro, if they just if they're not actually building a team around you, you just you got to do what's best for you. Yep. And what's best for you is coming to the Lakers. That's yeah. What's best for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, we definitely leaving it off for that. Last thing. Uh, Celtics Heat in Boston tonight. Who you got game one? Celtics. I got Celtics too. I got Celtics as well. Uh, look, that's going to do it for another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. That's Dame. Please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, Apple Music, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts. Be sure to leave five stars and leave a review. Um, and we out. Peace. Yes, sir.